good morning, everyone. Uh, the marks and feedback to coursework are now available online. Are there any questions? It's actually the coursework is a laboratory assignment. Any questions? No questions. Uh, so I finished uh, chapter six uh, last week. A few examples, I think a couple of examples are left from chapter six, which I solved them today. And I also solve a few exam, uh, exam um, style questions for you. Now before uh, moving on to solving examples, I would like to give you a few tips in relation to your exam. First of all, uh, may I ask you please uh, to download uh, the course materials uh, from Blackboard, not just, not just for this unit, any other units you have, please download them as soon as you can, especially those students who are traveling to see their friends and family. In case you lose uh, your files or the system is not working, for example, the day before the exam, it is not considered as a mitigating circumstance and you won't be compensated for it. So my advice to you is that on Friday that all the material, I mean all the courses have finished the teaching, so please uh, download them and make a backup of your files. And the other advice is uh, before uh, the exam, a few days before the exam, uh, solve a few examples uh, just uh, using your formula sheets. I uploaded uh, the formula sheets, the ones that you're going to get in your exam last week. And the exam is just two hours. You don't have time during the exam to look for the equations. You should know where everything is as soon as you read the description of a question. You just go and get that, exam, that equation from that page of your formula sheets. So I repeat, a few examples, just solve them please, using your formula sheets. The other advice is that do not memorize uh, any concept, anything in this course, because this is an analytical subject. Not just this course, any other analytical unit you have this semester. Do not memorize anything. Try to understand the concept. If you understand the concept, you can easily apply it to solution of any examples you read and you see in your examination paper. If you compare all the examination papers, perhaps you see them differently, but they're all the same, very similar. I, you can use the same set of equations for solutions of all those exam, exam papers. So my advice to you, understand the concept. Each chapter is trying to tell you, to explain to you. So try to understand the concept rather than memorizing any equation or any solutions. The other advice to you is that when each question in the exam only takes one minute to read, so please Give yourself one or two minutes for each question in the exam. Read it carefully before you start writing any solutions. For example, last year, one, one of the students, I, I mean, it was very sad, one of the students had to spend about, I, I suppose, half an hour for five a question, which was only for five marks, and filled a two pages of the script, and even the solution was not correct. So my advice to you is that read the description and try to answer whatever you've been asked to do. So sometimes I read in the scripts, that examination scripts, that for example, a question is required A and the, the student is answering B. So try to read the description of the example and just answer the requirements. And the other, question, the other advice is that 
if you cannot answer, if you cannot answer a question at a time, skip it. Five minutes, ten minutes later, get back to it and, tr and then try to analyze it. Don't spend a lot of time thinking about a question. There are other questions that you could answer, but because of some of the students panic at the time, cannot remember how to solve a question. So my advice to you, when you read a description of a question, you cannot answer it, just leave it and then you can come back to it in 10 minutes, 15 minutes time, and I'm 100% sure you can solve it later on. And my, ad my other advice is that when I was uh, looking at your coursework is that you need to include the complete solution. Do not do anything in your head. You can get as many booklets as you want during the examination time. So whatever you think is correct, just write it in your script. Do not do anything in your head. Because your papers, your scripts, are going to be checked by the external examiner. So even if I feel the answer is correct, but there is no solution there, I cannot give you full mark for the question. So whatever comes to your head, just write it down. You get some marks for it. And I think that's about it. Are there any questions in regard uh, to the exam? The tips I have, these are the things I thought perhaps I should let you know. Yes, please. Um, do you have any questions? That's a very good question. The, your examination paper, the format of your examination paper is very similar to the ones I have uploaded for you. So there are four questions, four large questions, and each question has got a smaller bits in it. And I've tried to make sure those little bits are not connected. So if you cannot solve one bit, you can solve the rest of it. So if you look at the exam papers from previous years, a question like 25 marks has been divided to a smaller section, so you cannot solve one part of it. I'm, I'm sure you can put another part of it. The problem with giving a very large question, if a student cannot solve it, you just lose 25 marks in one go, so that's not fair on you. Does it answer the question? So as I said, the format of your paper is very similar to the ones I have uploaded for you. There are four papers at the moment, four or five papers for you, I uploaded for you. I didn't upload the one uh, from uh, two years ago because the exam was online and the style was completely different. It was an open book exam. And that was relatively long uh, examination paper. So I didn't upload that one for you. But the ones online are very similar. As I said, they're all the same analytically. You use the same set of equations to solve all those four or five examination papers. So if you understand the concept, you can easily apply them. Any questions? Any other questions? Yes, please. Two hours. Two hours, yes. So as I said, please solve a few questions in using your formula sheets and during the exam, it's two hours, you don't have time to look for equations. Because some students think, okay, the equations are there, why bother? You need to know where everything is, so you can just use that equation from page one, two, three, and solve the related example. Any other questions? Okay. Now, I have, as I said, I uploaded for you the formula sheets and the first part is related to chapter one. It's very similar to previous years, no difference at all. So in chapter one, you learned mostly about components which were subject to axial loading. And the outcome was obviously normal stress, either tension or compression. So when the force was applied a normal to the section, the outcome was normal stress. We use symbol sigma to show it. And when the component was subject to shear force, then the force was tangent or parallel to section. Obviously, the outcome was shear stress. So mathematically, the two equations are identical. So the only difference is how the force is applied. Is it normal to the section or is it parallel? 
you have the equilibrium equations. So for a component to assign equilibrium in a two-dimensional, for a two-dimensional problem, the summation of the forces in x direction must be zero, summation of the forces in y, and summation of the moments with respect to any point on, this, uh, on the plane. You can use this equation just once. Each one of them can, also, can all be used once. So for um, metallic materials, we have a two engineering constants to identify it to a Young's a modulus and a parcel ratio. The third one exists, a shear modulus, but it's not an independent material property. Once you've got the other two, you can find the third one. You also learned about um, thermal stress and thermal strain when there is temperature variation in the environment. Uh, how it affects the stress and the strain a component experiences. So we mostly focus on a unidirectional loading and the, the effect of temperature was just mostly considered in the axial direction. So if the component has no restraint, obviously we have no thermal stress. And in that case, we have thermal strain, and the thermal strain, because temperature is a scalar quantity, is equal to alpha delta t in all directions, where alpha is the coefficient of a thermal expansion. If material is constrained, it cannot move, therefore, when we increase or decrease the temperature, we have thermal stress. Usually, we don't have thermal strain. I also introduced uh, you the, to the constitutive equations for two-dimensional problems. Obviously, this is for plane stress problems. And we included the effect of temperature in the equations. So you can see the two equations we have here, and also on page four, the difference between them is the inclusion of the temperature variation. So the shear strain, is equal to the shear stress divided by shear modulus. And we have two normal sh strains in the x and y directions written in terms of the two stress components. You also were introduced to the concept of strain energy. And I saw a few examples using the concept of en strain energy for you. And I showed you that the strain energy is stored per unit volume of a component which is subject to normal stress is equal to sigma squared divided by 2a. And it, it doesn't matter which type of load is applied. Is it bending? Is it any other type of loading? We can use uh, this equation to find the energy stored per unit of volume. And if the force applied is not uniformly distributed, your stress is not uniformly distributed, then you need to perform a volume integral. If a component is subject to shear, obviously, the equation mathematically is similar, but the value of the energy stored per unit volume is equal to 2 squared divided by 2g. For component which were subject to axial loading, if you have the deflection, then we can, instead of finding the overall volume integral, we can say the strain energy, the total strain energy is stored as capital E is the force multiplied by deflection divided by two. And if it's subject to torsion again, and we have angle of twist, for example, we can say it's a torque multiplied by the angle of twist divided by two. So these are all the equations you had from chapter one. Now we move on to chapter two. Chapter two was relatively short. We analyzed a thin walled cylinder subject to internal pressure and a thin walled sphere subject to internal pressure. For thin walled cylinders, we considered different end conditions when the end were open, when the end were closed, and when we had extra reinforcements in the axial direction of the cylinder. So the, the equations at the moment you see for our foreclosed ended one, the other two, if it's open-ended, or if they have axial reinforcement, then you need to find the equilibrium equations in the z direction or axial direction of the cylinder and then find the axe, who, 
stress or circumferential stress. So the equations at the moment you see are for a closed end cylinder. So the axial stress is equal to pressure multiplied by the mean diameter divided by four times the thickness of the cylinder. And hoop stress is obviously is twice this value. So you can see these two equations are very similar to the one I showed you on page one without including the temperature variation. For a small element in the wall of the cylindrical pressure vessel, we can consider Z is in the X direction and we can consider theta to be in the Y direction. So this is uh, the volumetric strain for a thin walled cylinder, which is twice uh, the hoop strain and plus the axial strain. And this year, I added this equation as well, volume of a cylinder. I noticed some students don't use the right equation for volume of the cylinder. Everything else is correct, but this volume sometimes is not correct, which is a bit funny, because you have learned it many years ago. You learned it many years ago. And the other one is for a thin wall, the sphere subject to internal pressure, we only have one equation to calculate the stresses, so we don't have axial stress, we only have hoop stress. But if you notice here, it's PD over 40, which is similar to PD over 2T4, cylinder subject to axial stress. So again, we have only one equation showing the strain in a, a, a thin wall sphere subject to internal pressure, volumetric strain three times epsilon a theta, and also added this equation, which is the volume of a sphere this year. So these two are added this year. They didn't exist in the previous year. Now, chapter three, we mostly focused on moments of area. First moment of area, second moment of area, and polar second moment of area. So these are the equations you have. These are just general equations for finding the position of the center of gravity of centroid of a section. Second moment of areas, second moments of area, and parallaxis theory. And these are for composite sections. So for rectangular section, the two equations, one over 12 bh cubed, b is the width, h is the height and one with respect to x, the other one with respect to y. And for a circular section, these two are for solid sections, not for thin walled sections. A common mistake among you in exam, 20%. The, the solution is for a thin walled section and the, or thin walled cylinder. They use these two equations for finding ix and ry. So they assume the cylinder is solid. So please, these two are for solid sections, not thin walled sections. These are four uh, tubes with the outer diameter of DO and inner diameter of DI, IX and IY. And the J is obviously the summation of these two. For thin sections, we can also use an approximate solution for finding the second moment of area in the x or y directions for a, obviously, a thin wall cylinder. So the, at the moment, I've given you Ix and Iy for half a, a for a semicircular thin wall section. So if you want for the full section, so you multiply it by two, so it becomes Ix equal to Iy equal to pi r cubed t. For full circle, this is half of it. So multiply by two. And J is obviously is equal to Ix plus Iy, so you have got four times this value, so it makes it two pi r cubed t. So you haven't been given the approximate solution for a thin wall cylinder. You can easily extract it from this equation. You can use this equation to find Ix and Iy for a thin walled cylinder. So these are the exact solutions, and this is for approximate solution. For uh, an arc here, assuming uh, the theta starts from y-axis, then in that case, we can use 
these equations I for Ix and Iy of an arc. So phi is the central angle. So these are the equations you have in chapter three. Now chapter four, if you remember, you using the equations in chapter four, which was based on the theories of torsion, you could analyze circular cylinders subject to torsion. The circular cylinders could be solid, could be hollow, could be thin wood. But if they are thin wood, in order to use those two equations, they have to be, they have to have a uniform thickness. So this is for circular cylinders. Now these equations for thin wood sections which are closed, either single cell or multi-cell. Now, I have added this part this year, and that is a torsion of a thin walled cylinders, um, which are or thin walled sections, which are open. So I repeat, this has been added this year. So first, circular cylinders, close a thin walled sections, open, sorry, closed thin wall section, single cell or multi-cell, and open thin wall sections subject to torsion. So in theories of torsion, the effect of torsion, it applies a shear stress and a twist angle. So you can use these equations to find them. So again, a common mistake among students, if they have been given a thin wall section of arbitrary shape, they use the top equation, or vice versa. For you can analyze a thin walled tube with uniform thickness using this equation. That is absolutely correct, but it doesn't work other way around. So these are the equations I repeat or added this year. Now we move on to chapter five. So in chapter five, Obviously, it was based on a theories of a bending. So the equation on the top of this slide, they can be applied to thin sections, thick sections, and solid sections. It's no difference. For normal stress, for shear stress, or flexural shear stress, the relation between the bending moment and the second derivative of deflection, so this is bending and stiffness, and the relation between the shear force distributed to it. <coughs> and so there is no difference if you're analyzing, sorry, there is no difference if you're analyzing a solid section, I repeat, thin or thick walled section. The only requirement is the section must have one axis of symmetry, so we are talking about symmetric bending. Now, when a thin wall section is subject to lateral shear force, we can make some approximation in calculation of the bending moment, uh, sorry, in calculation of the second moment of area. So here we can say B is equal to the thickness. So the product of the thickness and the shear stress is called shear flow. So the only difference we have for Thin wall sections is at the bottom when we are calculating the flexural shear stresses. So this is uh, for finding the shear flow distribution when a component is subject to a lateral shear force. And in, this is how we can find the position of the shear center. So the top ones applicable to any structure provided it's symmetric. And the bottom ones are just for flexural shear stress of thin sections. So in chapter six, we focus on combined loading and two-dimensional stress strain analysis. So I briefly covered it in chapter one, at the end of chapter one, because we needed those equations for chapter two, analysis of thin sections subject to <coughs> pressure. 
Now, if you look at chapter six, I mean, the equations for chapter six, so these are the same as what you see and I showed you earlier on the first page. Now, if you look at the last page of your formula sheets, we have some stress-related equations and we have some strain-related equations. So we use them for stress analysis and these are obviously for strain analysis. Mathematically, they're very similar. And obviously, criteria for yielding are covered for you of based on stress values. So these are related to the left-hand side. You can study the stress analysis and end up with the strain values. Then you calculate the stresses, but then use these three criteria for a yielding. So this was a brief summary of what we covered in this course from chapters one to six. Are there any questions in relation to equations I've got for you here? Okay. So I'm going to solve a couple of examples which are left from a chapter six, and then we move on to solving some exam style questions. In a question one of chapter six, we have stresses at a point which are 54 megapascals, 30 megapascals in the y direction, and the shear stress of five. The problem is asking us to determine the principal and maximum shear stresses and their directions, and whether the material yields based on the ranking for Mises and Tresca yield criteria. The safe stress or yield stress is equal to 50 megapascals. So in order to find out whether the material fails based on ranking theory, we need the maximum and minimum principal stresses. So these are the equations. It should be sigma one and two. So using the three stress components we have, we can find the two principal stresses. So if you remember, principal planes were the plane at the point, passing at the point, which were only subject to normal stresses, no shear stresses at all. And the maximum principal stress is the maximum normal stress occurring on a plane passing that through that point. So we have sigma x, which is 54 megapascals, Sigma y, I substitute the values. For shear stress, it doesn't make any difference. It's positive or negative. Because it is a squared, it does not affect the solution. So I substitute the three values in the two equations. I should, have, I should have written here sigma one and two. So I substitute the values. So as I said, the plus sign does not necessarily give, give us, it does not necessarily give us always the maximum principal stress. Sometimes the negative one gives us the maximum principal stress. So the maximum principal stress here is 55 megapascals. Now I'm going to compare with the yield stress of the material. And uh, before doing that, orientation of the two planes, that's the equation for it. So tangent of two theta n is for principal uh, for principal stresses or the directions of the principal planes and tangent of two theta is the equation which is equal to minus sigma x minus sigma y divided by two to x y is for direction of the maximum and minimum shear stresses. At the moment we just need principal directions. So two to x y two times five divided by the difference between these two from there, using your calculator, you can find the theta. Now, it doesn't matter um, you use a radians or a degrees, it depends on the setup of your calculator. As you can see, we work with tangent of two theta, sine of two theta, or cosine of two theta. So from here, we find the orientation of uh, the two planes. So one is 22.62, the other one is 22.62 plus 90 degrees. The maximum and minimum shear stresses, 
You can either use this equation, you can say 2, 1, and 2, 2 are equal to the difference between these two divided by 2, your choice. You end up with the same value. So 55 minus 29 divided by 2 should give us the same answer. And this is the orientation of the maximum and minimum planes of the maximum and minimum shear stresses. So does this, does this fail? Obviously it fails because 55 megapascals is greater than 50. So based on ranking, the ranking theory, obviously it fails. Based on the Tresca, the maximum and minimum shear stresses must remain less than the half the yield stress. So based on the Tresca criterion, this does not fail. So sigma y divided by 2 is 50 divided by 2, so 13 is less than that. And for misses, so the for misses equation at the moment I am finding the for misses stress, effective stress, or equivalent stress. These are the different names given to for misses stress. I'm using in the same coordinate system, you can also use these two values to find the form misses the stress. If I use these two values, then we don't have 2, 1, 2. It doesn't exist. So the equation ends up to be a square root of sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared minus sigma 1, sigma 2. It's your choice, whichever you want to use. So it end up with 48 megapascals. Does this fail? No, nope. good. So 48 is less than uh, the yield this yield stress of the material. So based on these two criteria, uh, it does not fail, but based on ranking theory, it fails. So any question from question number one? So this is relatively a straightforward question. Okay. Now the next question, again from a chapter uh, uh, six. It's a, a, a actually an exam style question. We have a thin walled uh, cylinder. Is subject to an axial load of 150 kilonewtons and a torsional moment of 15 kilonewton meters. The, the mean diameter of the cylinder is 250 millimeters and the wall thickness is 5. The problem is asking us to calculate the normal and shearing stress components acting in the wall of the shell on a plane whose normal is at 40 to the cylinder axis then we need to find the principal maximum shear stresses at that position and whether the material fails according to ranking theory. The yield stress is given and the other requirement is to draw the Mohs diagram showing the above values. So I have, in the, ne in the next slide, I have included all the data given and the requirements. And this is the inspection point. So first is asking us to find stresses or applied on a plane passing through this point whose normal makes angle of 40 degrees with the X axis or Z axis at the moment. So here I've attached capital X, capital Y to the cross section, capital Z is along the axis, and then I have assumed a little x little y attached to this element here. Now, this section is subject to an axial force F. So, if you're in chapter one, if I've got an axial force, the force here is tension, so it applies a tensile stress on this element. So, I need the cross-sectional area of this thin wall cylinder. Because it is thin, I can say the area is equal to pi dt. Or you can say pi over 4, 
Fourth power of, no, sorry, not fourth power. Second power of outer diameter minus second power of inner diameter. So the area either for a thin section is pi dt or the exact solution pi over 4 OD outer diameter squared minus inner diameter squared. We also, because the section is subject to torsion, we need this polar second moment of area. So this is the exact solution and this is approximate solution. So here we've got the force F, it applies an axial stress at normal ten, I mean tension. So it's force divided by the area, pi dt. It gives us 38.2 megapascals. We have no internal pressure. So the, there is no force applied in the y direction. So therefore, the stress is zero. We also have a torque. The torque, chapter four, only applies a shear stress. And the shear stress is TR over J. So the torque is given, 15 kilonewton meters. Is located on the outer layer. The radius is 150. J, I calculated from this relation or this one, whichever you prefer, and it gives us 30.55 megapascals. Now look at the element now. On the element, we've got stress in the x direction. So this is little x, this is little y. I've attached capital X, capital Y. So this point here is the element you see at the moment. So these are the stresses applied at this location. So we have no stress in the y direction. We only have a stress in the x and shear stresses. Now we are after stresses on a plane whose normal makes angle of 40 degrees with the x-axis. So I have the equation for it. I extract it from formula sheets. It shows me the normal stress acting on this plane. And this is showing me the shear stress acting on, the, on this plane. So I, at the moment, I'm not calculating S theta. If I want S theta, then I just convert these two to negative sign. Otherwise, at the moment, only asking us to find S and an SS. So theta is 40. So cosine of 2 theta is cosine of 80. Sine of 80, I subset the values. So from here, we calculate SN and SS. Any questions? So the next requirement is to find, to find out whether it's going to fail based on the ranking theory. For ranking theory, we need a principal stresses, maximum and minimum principal stresses. So for Tresca, we need minimum and maximum shear stresses. So I look at the formula sheets. I just try sigma over n, one, because I, I'm after just the maximum value here. If I substitute the values, so this is the answer. 55.13 megapascals. Mm -hmm. Now the yield stress of the material is 100. Is this going to fail? No. So 55.13 is less than 100, so it doesn't fail. If I want to find it based on the Tresca criterion, then I say 2, 1. I don't think it's the requirement of the question, but if I was asked to find it, I should say 2, 1 and 2, 2 are equal to 55.13 minus minus 16.93 divided by 2. So that was the equation for minimum and maximum shear stresses, 2, 1 or 2, 2 is equal to the maximum principal stress minus minimum principal stress divided by 2. And based on the Tresca criterion, this must be 
less than half the yield shreds. So we have 55.13 minus minus because this is minus. So I can easily find out that it failed based on the Tresca criteria. Any question in relation to the slide I'm showing you? Yes, please. Yes, yes, that's absolutely correct. So I show you here. It's a different color. So this element I've shown you here, and this is actually here. As I said, stress is not a vector quantity, it's a tensor quantity. So at each point, we need to have for a two-dimensional problem, we have three independent stress components. So here is a point, but just for us to understand it, I've drawn it as a square. This is actually a point here, this point. Does it answer the question? Yes, please. Uh, which values of, uh, which values are you substituting in as sigma x and sigma y in the principal strain equation? Okay. In this one? Yeah. Okay, good question. I just say sigma x is equal to, what is sigma x equal to? It's 30.55. Sigma y is equal to 0. And 2xy is equal to 38.2. Uh, no, no, sorry. This was 38. My mistake. So this is sigma x is equal to 38.2, sigma y is equal to 0, and 2xy is equal to 30.55. So this is the shear stress I've shown you, and this is sigma x. Does it answer the question? So if I just use this, it's easier. So sigma x is 38.2 and sigma y is equal to 0 and twice y is equal to 30.55. Very pretty slide now. Okay, any questions? Okay, even one to drawing the same, I mean, finding the same solution graphically using a Mohs diagram. So, this is the element, it's subject to stress of sigma x 38.2, shear stress of 30.55. This is normal, and it's um, tension. And this is obviously, on this plane is anticlockwise, on this plane is clockwise. So first I find uh, the stress state on plane A is subject to a normal stress of 38.2 plus. It's anticlockwise 30.55 on the Mohs diagram ends up to be negative. The stress state on point B, we've got a normal stress of zero, and a clockwise a shear stress of 30.55. On the Mohs diagram, it appears to be positive. So you can see the coordinates of this plane, the stress state of plane B. We've got a normal stress of zero. This is Anticlockwise, so it appears, sorry, this is clockwise, it appears to be positive on the Mohs diagram. This is anticlockwise, it appears to be negative on the Mohs diagram. Now I join the two. So this is the x axis, this is the y axis. The angle subtended between two planes on the physical element is half 
the corresponding angle between the same planes on the Moon's diagram. Now I drew the circle. So this is going to be the maximum principal stress, and this is going to be minimum principal stress. So the two, co the two points here, they don't have any shear coordinates. They only have normal coordinates. So this must be maximum principal stress, and this must be minimum principal stress. Now the top, this point is the point which has the highest shear coordinate. <coughs> Sorry. So at the moment I ignore the X coordinate or normal coordinate of this point. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in the maximum and minimum shear, the maximum and minimum shear stresses. So the, SN co the SS coordinate of this point is 36. Obviously, it is subject to normal stress. The plane of maximum shear stress is subject to some normal stress, but this value is less than the maximum principal stress. So the orientation of the principal plane, you can see if you use a protractor, you can find this angle on a graph paper, which is 58, divided by 229. So on the physical element, if I rotate it anticlockwise for 29, I reach the principal direction. And the, another requirement was to find the normal stress and shear stress acting on a plane whose normal makes angle of 40 degrees with the x-axis. So 40 multiplied by 2 gives us 80. So from here, I need to rotate this x-axis for 80 degrees. So the, these two points, the coordinates of this point were the ones we calculated earlier. And if I'm after S, theta and SS, obviously, are the coordinates of this point. Any questions? So it's 13 minutes to 11. So could you get back here, 3 minutes to 11? So I solve a few more examples for you.
Good morning again. So in the first hour, I gave you a few tips in relation to your exam, and I briefly went through the examination formula sheets and solved the remaining questions of chapter six. Now, I would like to solve a few exam questions. The first one is selected from examination paper 2019-20. If you just stop eating, please. It's not a cinema here. So this is from the examination paper 2019 and 20, and is similar to the questions we solve in chapter four, theories of torsion. So in this one, we've got a two cell ring section, and a uniform a two-cell aluminium tube, so it's made of aluminium all over. The thickness is a variable, so I'm reading uh, the question and I'm reading uh, the description first before I start solving the example. So it's subjected to a pure axial torque of one and a half kilonewton meters, so the torque value is given. The section is symmetric about the x-axis, Cell one has a uniform uh, thickness of two millimeters. So the left cell has the same thickness all over. And cell number two and the vertical web have a uniform uh, thickness of T. It means a T is unknown for us. So this is T all over here. So T is unknown. The areas of cells one and two are given 0.1 meter squared and 0.2 meter squared. And the rest of dimensions are shown, obviously, in millimeters. If the shear stress in the vertical web is zero, determine the shear flow distribution in each cell. The thickness T, the unknown value of cell two, and the rate of twist. And the material, as I said, is the same and the, is made of aluminum with a shear modulus of 27. Now, in this case, it says that the shear stress in the vertical web is zero. The shear stress in the vertical web is equal to the difference between the shear flows between the two divided by the thickness, T. So if I was asked to find the shear stress of the vertical web, I say that it's equal to the difference between the shear flows of the left and right ones divided by the thickness. So when it is equal to zero, it means the two shear flows are equal. So Q1 equal to Q2 and equal to Q. Any question in relation to this one? A bit similar to the coursework you did. You submitted last week. So the this is a still two cell tube. So we have T equal to 2A1Q1 plus 2A2Q2, equilibrium of torques. The external torque is equal to the summation of the two internal torques. Now Q1 and Q2 are the same, so I can say T is equal to two times A1 plus A2 multiplied by Q. The torque is given, I substitute the value of the torque, which is equal to 1.5 kilonewton meters, A1 and A2 are given. From there, I can calculate Q. So the first part is done. The shear flow distribution in each cell. Now the next part is the thickness T of cell number two, because T is unknown. We are still working on a two cell tube. So the two cells, the system is in equilibrium. Because of compatibility, both of them rotate with the same angle of twist, or the length is the same, or the same rate of twist. And what is the equation for d theta over d z is equal to one over two a multiplied by loop integral of d s over g t, which is not correct. Q is missing. I can't correct it here. Sorry. Um, Q is missing here.
So from here, we've got d theta over dz for a cell number one. Because it's made of the same material, I extract g from the integral, place it outside. Now this is shear flow on the left-hand side, q1 multiplied by, this is the shear flow in this uh, panel is q1, q1, q1. The system is symmetric, I mean the tube is symmetric, so we've got 500 plus 500 plus 180 gives us 1,180 multiplied by the shear flow on the left cell, which is Q1, divided by the thickness 2. So I'm still in cell 1, plus 200, multiplied by this is 200, multiplied by the difference between these two divided by T. Now this is equal to 0. Q1 was already calculated from the top. If I substitute in this relation, I can easily find the angle of twist, d theta over dz. Now, d theta over dz of a cell number one and two are the same. Now, I repeat the same for the second cell. So, all these panels have shear stress of q2. Now, the length of the panel, we've got 800 plus 800 is 1600 plus 150 gives us 1,750. So they all have the same thickness as well. So instead of solving it, I mean dividing it to three panels, I've done them in one go because they have the same thickness and the shear flow. So 1,750 is the summation of all these three. The thickness is T. Again, for the vertical panel, we have 200 times Q2 minus Q1 divided by T. So from the top one, I can calculate and find the rate of twist. From the bottom one, I can find the thickness T. Any question in regard to this part? Yes, please. That's correct, yes. So, because this shape is not something a student can calculate during the exam, so I gave them the area. So, A1 is this area, this region here, not the cross-sectional area. That is a very good question. Is the area enclosed by the perimeter? So, this is this blank area, empty area. And this is A2. Any question in relation to this part of... Yes, please. Just check, will the rate of twist be the same for both cells? Say that you'd be Will the rate of twist be the same for both cells? Yes, because that was, um, if you remember, I think it's the very last slide of uh, chapter four. If you're sol solving a multi cell tube and you apply a torque, you say the torque, the external torque, is equal to the summation of the internal torques. So we have, this is the. Internal torque of cell number one is the internal torque of cell number two. So we had the equilibrium equation, but you can see here we cannot solve the problem by just using equilibrium. We need compatibility equation. So when we apply the torque, all of them work together as a system. They all twist with the same angle, same angle. They have, and because the cross-sectional area is uniform along the length, Therefore, the same have the same rate of twist. What was the definition of the rate of twist? Angle of twist divided by the length. So this is what we call equilibrium, and this is what we call compatibility. They all rotate with the same angle. So for single cell, we don't need this relation. For multi cell, we have to combine equilibrium and compatibility equation to solve it. It's, the, I believe, the very last slide of chapter four, theories of torsion. Any other questions in relation to this example? And again, a common mistake among you, if when, say, I say the shear stress in the vertical verb is zero, they treat a 
the section as a single cell. It is a multi-cell. We know it is zero. We know we end up with an equation which is very similar to a single cell. But it's not a single cell tube. It is still a multi-cell tube. Now we move on to the next part of this question. The next part of the question is, is that if the shear stress in the vertical web is one megapascal and the shear flow in cell number one is less than cell number two, usually when the area of a cell is bigger, it's subject to a bigger shear flow or shear stress. However, I've given this requirement, I gave this requirement to students, so assume Q2 is greater than Q1. Now, I asked them to find uh, the shear flow in each cell because I thought perhaps it, they already spent time here. So I said to find it in terms of T to save some time. So here we say the shear stress in the vertical web is one megapascal. What is the definition of the shear stress in the vertical web? The difference between two shear flows divided by the thickness. Since we say Q2 is greater than Q1, so we say Q2 minus Q1 divided by T is one megapascal, and obviously Q1 minus Q2 divided by T becomes minus one megapascal. So if I say Q2 is bigger than Q1, then I say, if I say Q1 is bigger than Q2, I say Q1 minus Q2 divided by T is positive, and the other one becomes negative. So at the moment, we say Q2 is bigger than Q1. So Q2 minus Q1 divided by unknown thickness of T is one megapascal. Now I'm going to just repeat whatever we did on the top with this new requirement. So compatibility equation, the two rate of twist are the same. So I say d theta over dz. Now I cannot say it's equal to zero anymore. Q1 minus Q2 divided by t. Is it plus one or is it minus one? Minus one. So here we say this is plus. So this becomes a minus one. So from here, we have a d theta over dz1 in terms of Q1. This becomes a plus one. Then we can write it in terms of Q2. If we equate these two, I can find both of them in terms of, I can find the relation between Q1 and Q2. And then using top equation, it's very similar to your course, part of your coursework, the second coursework you did. And using equilibrium equation, I can easily solve the last part of this question. Any question in relation to this examination question? Shall I move on? Yes? Yes, please. Could you say it louder, louder? You evaluated the rate of twist before the thickness, is it? That's correct. No? Sorry? Oh, no, no. You find this, this one. At the moment, you no. have a value here. Part, part one, this one. Part two and three. This bit. Okay, okay can you answer my question, please? Yeah. The question you're asking, is it about this part or this part? Yeah, that part. This part, okay. Yeah. Is it one, a two, or three? Two and three. Two and three. In this case, you have, first of all, from here, you don't need thickness, do we? 
No, because we said this is zero. So from here, we calculate Q. Say so it's two newtons per milli, two newtons per millimeter. Now, I write these two equations. You agree that this is zero, and this is zero as well. Do we need a thickness for this part? No. So we find the angle of twist from this equation. Once we've got the angle of twist, then from the second one, I can find the thickness. Or if the requirement is to find the thickness first, because it's got eight marks in exam, if I'm clever, I sometimes are, so I just equate these two, find the thickness first, and then I use the equation to find the... Again, there are different ways of doing it. So do you agree that we can find, we have Q from this equation, we have Q, we can find the angle of twist, then we can substitute the second one, find the thickness. Or I can equate these two directly, find the thickness first, and then find the angle of twist. It's a different ways of doing it. And are you happy with the second part? Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? I mean, do we have to still count the, uh, like the middle uh, separation between cell lines? Yes. So what I'm saying that is that that is a, for part one, this is a still two cell tube. A few students in the exam, they just treated it like a, a single tube. When they were finding the angle of twist, they were using the whole section, which is not correct. So you can see that for angle of twist, I'm just using the information from one cell. So I know it is zero, but I'm not just, as you can see, it's for a multi-cell tube. Some students, maybe 5%, not everybody, uh, a few students, they haven't, done they haven't done the revision properly, they just say, all right, because this is zero, why not treating as a single cell? It's not a single cell, it's a, a still multi-cell. Very good questions. Any other questions? Now, in your coursework, you didn't need uh, the thickness of the vertical for the first part of the question. If you remember, I didn't, you didn't need it. But in this one, because T is all over here for the second cell, then we find it in the first part as well. Okay, we move on to the next example. So this is again another example here. It's very similar. That is from chapter, again chapter four, very similar to the one I solved for you. It's um, the cross-section of an aluminum thin wall section with variable thickness subjected to a pure torque of 10 kilonewton meters over its five meter length. The shear modulus is 30 gigapascals Calculate the shear flow distribution, the maximum shear stress, the angle of twist. So at the moment, we've only got one cell subject to two. Similar to examples I saw for you during the lectures. So the first part is quite straightforward. T, the torque applied is 2 AQ. So the area enclosed by the perimeter is the area of half a circle and a trapezium. So this is something you can do in exam, so I didn't give them the areas. So I asked them, they could have done it easily. So here I repeat area, half a circle, enclosed by the perimeter, and the area of the trapezium. The torque is given, so I just find the shear flow first. The next requirement is to find the maximum shear stress the maximum shear stress for a single cell always occurs in the minimum thickness. So I'm not going to waste my time in the exam to do it for all the thicknesses. For a single cell, I look which one is the thinnest one. Obviously here is the thinnest one, one millimeter. So Q divided by T min gives us 2.63 megapascals. Single cell. And finally, the angle of twist. So 
for angle of twist, I need the rate of twist first, then multiplied by the length. Length is five meters. So this is for a single cell. I'm allowed to have Q outside of the equation. It's made of the same material. So G can be taken out. I can either use Q over 2A or T over 4A squared, your choice. They both give you the same answer. And loop integral of DS over T. So if I've got, uh, say, the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system here, DS over T, I just go around the section and divide the length of each panel by its thickness. So 2,000 divided by 1.2. Then this pi d, pi r, is half the circle, pi r divided by 1. I find the length of this diagonal line divided by its thickness. The length of this vertical verb by its thickness. And it gives me 1.24 times then to the power of a minus 7 radians per millimeter. Now, this is the rate of twist. I've been asked to find the angle of twist. I multiplied by length. I don't think I've done it. Oh, yeah, I've done it. So I multiplied by the length. And if I, it's not at the moment, it hasn't asked me to find it in degrees. So to save time, I just write it in radians. If you want to convert it to degrees, fine. So this is a single cell, very, very similar to the questions, very similar to the questions we saw during the lectures. Any questions? Okay. And the second part of this question, this is a thin web made of titanium is placed between point A and B in a dotted position. The shear modulus of titanium is 40 gigapascals, and the shear stress must not exceed 0.6 megapascals. So it's a bit similar to your coursework. The shear flow distribution, now I'll calculate the shear flow distribution in each cell and the thickness of the titanium web. So this is, the thickness is unknown because we've given this information, so therefore they take away another information from us. So here, it not, must not exceed 0.6 megapascal. So in that case, the thickness is unknown. So Q1 and Q2, the equilibrium, the compatibility equation. Now writing there for the first cell. Now here I assume that because it's the bigger cell, Q1 is greater than Q2. So I didn't give them the requirement as Q1 to be greater than Q2. It's obvious this is bigger than the other one. Sometimes I give the, the requirement to make you um, more comfortable during the exam. So here, 1 over 2A1, the area of the cell number 1 enclosed by the perimeter. Now, I'm not allowed to put G outside the integral. I've kept it inside. Now, because I'm going to equate the two equations, I haven't written 30 times 10 to the power of 3 because I'm going to equate these two. So I've written 30 and 40. Why, if I want to calculate and find the rate of this, I have to say it is gigapascal, so it must be both of them must be multiplied by 10 to the power of 3. So this is the length of this one plus this one plus this one. So it's 2,000. I believe this is 2,000 something plus 500 gives us 4,561.6. So the oh, panel, this panel, the, uh, the diagonal panel, the vertical one, and the horizontal one, they all have the same thickness. If they didn't, I had to uh, do it individually. But at the moment, they're all subject to the same shear flow, Q1. They have the same thickness as well. So I've added them up. The thickness 1.2, the shear modulus 30 made of aluminium. 
Now we move on to the vertical panel. The height of the vertical panel is 500 plus 500,000. The shift in the vertical panel is the difference between these two. Q1 assuming is big, I mean, at the moment you are in, shear in the first one, so it's Q1 must be positive, Q2 negative, divided by the thickness of T, which is this thickness, and its shear modulus. Now we move on to the second cell. So 1 over A2, area enclosed by the perimeter, the, this is pi times uh, the radius, gives us this, this length here, and multiply by Q2, the shear flow, divided by the shear modulus of Q30. Now in this one, Q2 becomes positive, Q1 becomes negative. Now, assuming Q1 is greater than Q2, then Q1 minus Q2 divided by T gives us, uh, is equal to 0.6. So Q2 minus Q1 divided by T becomes minus 0.6. And from there, you can calculate Q1 and Q2. Any more? And two marks has to be done by inspection for a multi-cell. All oh, right, sorry, this is, this is something else. Um, it's, it's asking us not to exceed 0.6 megapascal. So, so in order to find this thickness, I say I find Q1 and Q2 because it should not exceed 0.6 megapascals. So the difference between these two divided by T should be equal to 0.6 or less than that. So the minimum thickness we should have is 1.028 millimeters. But for a multi-cell, if I was asked to find uh, the maximum shear stress, I have to do it by inspection. I should go through, go and inspect all the panels, the shear flow in them, and also the thickness, divided by the thickness in them. Any question in relation to this example? So this one was similar to the previous one, except the vertical web is made of a different material. Questions? Shall I move? Yes, please. So in the exam, we got to uh, calculate the tau for each panel. If you are asked to find where is the max, where is tau max? Yes, this is, that, that's what I was, mis I made a mistake. This is the requirement of just the vertical panel. Yeah. And I've not been asked to find the maximum shear stress. But if I was asked to find the maximum shear stress, yes, I have to do good. So for example here, I should say Q1 divided by 1.2, Q2 divided by 1, and then Q1 minus Q2 divided by T. See which of these three is the biggest. So that is what we call by inspection. But at the moment, it says uh, the shear stress in the vertical verb not to exceed 0.6 megapascals. Now, if it was a coursework, obviously there are many solutions for this example because it said not to exceed. It doesn't say it is equal to 0.6. But in exam, just go for one solution to get more full mark for it. So shall we move on? Yes. Okay. Let's solve another example. These are the, I've selected these examples, which are different with the ones I solved during the lectures. Or the, um, so this gives you a better idea of the type of question you might get. These are on the hard side. These are relatively hard questions. So in this one, we have an open thin wall section which has a uniform thickness. Just read the description, if it, whether the thickness is uniform or not uniform. So at the moment, the thickness is uniform. 
and it consists of two horizontal panels, two vertical panels, and a circular curved panel. And the central angle of this curved panel is 120 degrees. The section is symmetric with respect to the x-axis and is subject to the shear force F acting through its shear center. Now, the first part is asking us to find um, if, this, um, if the second moment of this area with respect to x-axis is this, determine and sketch the shear force distribution on the section. I think the first part is missing. Show how the position of the shear center can be calculated. I think this part, the first part is missing. Yeah, that is better. This is, I should have put it, the other one in seconds. So. so the first part of the question is, um, so the description is the same, but only part was missing was this part was missing from the previous slide. And the first part is asking us to determine uh, the second moment of area with respect to the x-axis here, which is the axis of symmetry. Obviously, a neutral plane passes through this axis. So first of all, we are going to calculate Ix. So we are in chapter 3. So definitely, you, in exam, you have one question at least to find the second moment of area of a thin walled section. Very, I mean, similar to the examples I saw for you in chapter three. So here I've divided it to a vertical panel, a horizontal one, and an arc, and I then multiplied it item by two. So you tell me which of these three, this equation belongs to. Just think about it. Yeah. Okay, go on. Parallel axis theorem. I, I know, I appreciate that. But um, this equation belongs to the vertical one, horizontal one, or the semicircular, the, this arc. <coughs> Just think about it, raise your hand when you know. The one I've written at the moment. Yes, please? Um, would it be for the horizontal one? Excellent, it's for the horizontal one. So for the horizontal one, we've got like a, assuming it, this horizontal one is like a rectangle. This rectangle has a, the length of, the width of A and the thickness of T. So for the horizontal panel, we've got 1 over 12 bh cubed. B is A, the height is T. Now because this is offset from the x-axis for this value here, which is A sine of 60 degrees, so I need the parallel axis theory. So 1 over 12 bh cubed plus A y bar squared. What is y bar is this distance, A sine of 60, squared, and what is the area of each panel is A times T. Is everybody happy about this equation I've written here? So the, because the top one and the bottom panel, they have one axis of symmetry, they're both located at the same distance from the x-axis, I just find one of them multiplied by two. Now let's do it for the, these two vertical panels. Again, we've got 1 over 12 bh cubed. b is equal to t, we have uniform thickness. h is equal to half a. And this is located at the distance of, so if this is, so if you look at here, this is the local axis of the top panel. So we've got 1 over 12, B is equal to T, H is equal to 0.5A cubed. So it's respect to this axis. And then we need the power axis theory, A by bar squared. We need to multiply by A times this distance. So 1 over 12, T, half A cubed, with respect to its own axis. 
Then half eight here is the area. <coughs> and this is this distance here squared. As I said, this was on the difficult parts. I mean, this is relatively difficult. It's this distance. Any problem with this part of the question? Okay, now we move on to the last part. For an arc with a central angle of 60 degrees, I extract this equation from the formula sheets. The central angle is 60, so 60 multiplied by 220, but I have to keep it as radians. This is when we are directly working with angles. So I keep it in terms of 60 times pi divided by 180 degrees. And then if I substitute the value, the answer is almost equal to three point something A cubed T. I don't know whether I've got the answer here, no. Any question in relation to this example? Please take a picture of him. Okay. Any questions? So, because t is small, obviously, t cubed is almost equal to zero, we ignore it and we write the rest of the values. Now, if I just go back to the previous description, now, it says that if, I mean, when you do the calculations, um, you end up with something close to three. So to make sure students that have made a mistake in finding IX are not going to be penalized for the rest of the question, I usually say, all right, if IX is equal to this value, please solve the rest of the example. So whatever value you get, just leave it and just use whatever value I've given for the remaining part of the question. This is for those students who make mistakes in the first part. Again, I, I if your solution is correct in exam, you get mostly, most of the mark if your answer is only answer is wrong. <coughs> so my advice to you is that try to solve as many questions as you can. Then if you have extra time, go back and do the calculations to see whether the answers are correct or not. So as I said, uh, I don't just give the, uh, to the final answer I mean, my mark is not for the final answer. If the solution is correct, you mostly get, I mean, you get most of the mark for that question. So here it says that if the second moment of area is equal to 3A cube T, determine and sketch the shear for distribution around the section and show how the position of the shear center can be calculated. So here, I'm not asking them to find the position of the shear center because it becomes, the question becomes very long. So what I've done here, just show this, how it's been calculated. So if you just write the equation, no calculations, that would be adequate to get full marks for it. So if you do the next part of this question, I think I did that part. I just jump to this one. So the section is symmetric with respect to the x-axis, so I've divided it to panel one, two, two, three, and three, four. These are the three Kevin-linear coordinate systems attached to point one, two, and three respectively. 
This is given, and the equation is V R V over I. Um, so the equation is this is F divided by I integral of y ds from s to zero is a variable. So f is f, and if I just substitute i here, one over i, which is one over three, ends up with 0.3333, which I've rounded it to 0.34. So this equation is valid for the whole section, but because we have these continuities at these two positions, at point two and point three, then what you have to do, we have to use different coordinate systems, curvilinear coordinate system for those three. So I studied panel one, two. So what, as you can see this equation, the difficulty with this equation is that we have two different coordinate systems. One is the Cartesian one, and the other one is curvilinear one. So we have to convert one to another. From point one to point two is parallel to the y-axis. So there must be a linear relation between these two, S and Y. Now here I, I can say Y, at, if you look at this, point here at y equal to zero, or yes, at y equal to, if this is 0.5a, this is 09a, it's better to write it, not to confuse you, so if it is almost equal to 0866, so it makes it 09a, So this is almost zero, it is 0866 because equal to A sine of 60, so it makes it almost 09A, so it means this distance is 04A. So here at S equal to zero, Y is equal to 04A, which is the difference between these two. And we can easily find this relation at S equal to 05a, the answer is 09a. So you can easily find this uh, linear relation between y and s. Any problem with this relation here? If you have difficulties, <clears throat> the way I've done it, you can just say y is equal to a multiplied by s plus b. So we have two unknowns. I can say at s equal to zero, y is equal to zero for a. So from there I can find either a or b, and the other, the other one is at y equal to, so the second one, at s equal to 05a, y is equal to 09a. Because these two axes are parallel, they have different origins, but they are parallel. There must be a linear relations, relation between them. So at s equal to 0, y is equal to 0 for a, which is the difference between these two. At s equal to 5a, 0.5a at this point, at s equal to 0, 5a, y is equal to 0, 9a. From these two, you can find a and b. a is equal to 1, and b is equal to 0, 4a. Now, I substitute in this equation. Now this is a linear function. The integral of a linear function becomes quadratic. And 
Therefore, it gives us a quadratic distribution. If there is no, um, I don't think I have got this case. I'll show you this, I drew it for you. So it gives us a quadratic distribution. Now, from point two and three, y is constant, which is equal to 0, 9, a, is parallel to the x-axis. So, And then we find a value of shear flow at point two from this equation, whatever you get, what's going on here? And whatever you get here, you substitute in the second one. And between point three and four, I have uh, used, uh, I've converted both of them to polar coordinates. And I assume the origin of the uh, polar for theta is y-axis. So in that case, y is equal to a cosine of theta, d is equal to a d theta. And once I've got um, Q3 from the top one, I substitute it here, integrate it. But look at this, in, this limits of this integral. At this point, 3 theta is equal to 30 degrees. So I've written in the integral as pi over 6. It does not start from y-axis. It starts from theta equal to 30 degrees. Okay, yes, please. If somebody wanted to do y with respect to the 60 degrees and not the 30 degrees that you uh, deduced, it would be a sine theta, right? Starting from point 4, you mean? No, starting from point 3, Instead of using the theta over here, we use the 60 degrees as our base angle, or, should, or, are, we base, or are we supposed to use theta as our base angle? Uh, the thing is, we cannot change the position of the center of the circle. The center of the circle is here. You can either use your origin, starting from this point here, and rotating it like that. But uh, I don't know what your question is. Well, we can either start uh, in a polar coordinate system, the origin either is on the x-axis or y-axis. Does it answer the question? Yeah, and I think I, and I, think I can understand the 30 degrees. So the, if you remember a while ago, I solved for you a fusional section, and the fusional section, it was convenient to start it from this point. So I started theta from this point, x-axis. In this one, it's more convenient uh, to use a y-axis as the origin. So in that case, you, have to, you end up with y equal to a cosine of theta. And then, for, because point 3 is not on the y-axis, then the origin, I mean, the limit of the integral, the lower limit is pi over 6, which is this angle, theta, this 30 degrees here. And so what they had to do for, I don't know, oh, yes. Uh, so finding the uh, position of the shear center, this equation is coming from your formula sheets. So as I said, I didn't ask them to find the position of the shear center. I asked them to show how the shear center can be obtained. So what they had to do, they had to write this equation from the formula sheets. And you can see this is what they should have written. I didn't expect anyone to do anything after this. So if you write this, fine. So you can see here, R for the first part. So it's the shear flow of the first part, panel one, two, shear flow of panel two, three, shear flow of panel three, four. Then we need to find R for each panel. The first panel, R, we are finding the moments with respect to the center of the circle here. So this is R for the first panel. This is R for the second panel. And this is R, obviously, for this arc panel. So as I said, this is a relatively difficult question. But the good thing about this example, I solve it every year for students. It covers everything we did in the last part of chapter 5. I don't think I've got the distribution on. If I want to draw the distribution for you, I think it's, I just need to get rid of these. Um, so in that case, 
and I drew it here. So we've got a quadratic distribution here. So it must be quadratic. Then, so it becomes no, Q1 is zero, then we end up with Q2. So here we've got And then we move on to Q. Here we have the stage shear fluid. Whatever we have here, we have it here. So this is Q2. Now between point one and three, if you integrate it, it becomes linear. So therefore, and obviously Q3 will be bigger, so it becomes linear. So I'm going to add some lines here similar to the ones I did for you in the lectures. So this is going to be Q3. And then we have, it's a curve panel. It has to be normal to the panel. So say this is Q3. And then we have if you do the integration, you end up with a parabolic distribution, a sinusoidal distribution. So you end up, I don't know why I haven't added it here. I usually forgot. So here we've got Q4. And if someone asks me to find the maximum shear stress, what I have to do, I have to divide the shear flat disposition by the thickness at this position. Now, can somebody tell me how I can find Q4? Yes, go on. Q34, but Q34, but instead of putting but the theta at the end is a pi over two. That is correct. So. No, no, you don't, you are absolutely right. But you do the integration. Yes. The final answer is in theta. And the theta value should be, you're right. If I start from here, it should be 90 degrees. So whatever I get here, so the answer to this one would be sinusoidal. So you've got a constant value here. That will be sine of theta So the integral of this is, so ignore the constant values. So it changes between theta and pi over six. So therefore it's sine of theta minus sine of pi over six, which is one over two. Once you get that, in order to find four, then you need to put a subset the value of theta, which is equal to pi over two. So in order, so theta equal to pi over two, you substitute in this relation to get Q4. Any questions? Oh, it's nine minutes, so I cannot solve any more. Yes, please. Yeah, just put this question in the exam. Do we have to draw the diagrams on both sides of it? No, 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 just, that's a very good question. Just one side, that's adequate, one side. Save your time. Because it's symmetric. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so if we draw it on both sides, it won't affect our mark. Say it again, please. If we draw it on both sides, it won't affect our chance of getting the mark. You get, no, yeah, it doesn't affect them. It's just a waste of your time. <laughs> okay. Any questions? So nine minutes uh, to um, just one slide remaining. So if I don't see you again, have a very, very nice Christmas. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So have a nice Christmas.